What's up, Canes fans? Welcome to the Canes Insight Daily Podcast, powered by Anajar and Levine, Accident Attorneys. Hope you had a great weekend. We are going to continue these season previews. It's getting close. We're talking real football. Had a little bit of recruiting talk this weekend. Of course, it was uh, the, the big cookout, so we talked recruiting on Friday. Now we're getting back to these position previews. Offensive line, my favorite topic. I know it's Mario Cristobal's favorite topic, and this is a loaded, loaded group. A lot different than the conversations we were having two, three years ago. So excited to jump into this group. First, I want to talk about some folks that will always protect you and your case, and that is Anajar and Levine Accident Attorneys. If you or someone you care about has been injured in an accident, you could be entitled to significant compensation. 1-800-747-FREE, 1-800-747-3733. Take back control of your life. Anajar and Levine, they don't get paid till you get paid. Paid. Pete, I got to fix that because I always mix, mess that up. You know? Yeah, well, listen, you know, you usually take your shots at the Columbus guys. Columbus, we're going to be put on the, the you know front and center with this conversation with the work that Coach Mirabal has done here. But, yeah, I love this position, D. I mean, this obviously, have, you know, represented multiple NFL offensive linemen. My guy Titus Howard being one of them who, you know, is, is a $58 million man. So I don't like to call myself an expert. I just listen to the people who are experts and, you know, try to put together the information as best as I can. But – Obviously, it was a position that was much maligned for good reason before Coach Cristobal came here. And we understood that step one for him building this roster out was going to be in the trenches, but primarily offensive line. Yeah, to me, this is a position where <laughs> it's almost, I don't say your grandma can scout it because she can't. There's a lot of intricacy that goes on to what Coach Mirabal does as far as flexibility, as far as foot quickness, as far as frame and all these sort of things. But I think if you take your grandma to practice maybe in 2021, you know, 2019, and you take her to practice now and just show her these, these two groups, it's very easy to see the physical difference between what we were dealing with back then and what we are dealing with now. What Coach Cristobal and Coach Mirabal inherited was basically a lot of centers either playing guard or tackle, which is not what you want. You want one center playing center. You don't want centers playing guard, centers playing tackle, but you saw that, whether it was Justice Solo Watson, um, DJ Scaife playing tackle, whether it was, you know, Ja'Kai Clark, kind of where he was at. Uh, it was not good. Logan Sagapolo, who was brought in, but was sort of a Band-Aid solution. Now you are seeing what it's supposed to look like with Coach Cristobal and Coach Mirabal having multiple recruiting classes, having developed some of these guys and being able to bring in some big-time transfers. It reminds me of when Jeff Stoutland was here, the best offensive line coach in the NFL with the Philadelphia Eagles, known for just getting big body types, big athletes, and coaching them up. When he was here, you had your Brandon Linders, your John Felicianos, Chantrell Henderson's, guys like that. And you're getting back to that physically with a lot of guys that I think we're going to be seeing play on Sundays for a long, long time. Yeah, the body types is the biggest thing. Obviously, you have your highly rated recruits that have been brought in. You do have a guy like Jalen Rivers who has been here for a while now, was brought in by the previous staff. But even the guys who are not the high four-star, five-star type recruit coming out d we understand that mirabon crispar are looking for certain size certain weight and then athleticism to go along with it the other stuff you can coach up a lot of times at the offensive line position but the physicality toughness the athletic you know upside and then of course the size yeah look let's start with what we had last year and what's outgoing Miami last year, very good offensive line, one of the best in the country, in my opinion, despite a quarterback that really wasn't protecting the ball. Running backs that weren't generating explosive runs on their own. Yet ranked 20th in yards per carry nationally, according to teamrankings.com. So, you know, they were able to get efficiency out of their run game despite lacking the 50 yard runs, the 40 yard runs, the 10 plus yard runs. Miami really ranked poorly in all those categories despite having a high yards per carry. They ranked third in. Uh, yards before contact so i think what you saw was an offensive line that did a great job in the running game and running backs that really didn't do anything extra we talked about the running back group you see that on youtube or on, on the audio platforms we also did a write-up on the website canesinsight.com sign up for free 6.9 million posts and counting but 
you know, the running backs really didn't help the offensive line, in my opinion. At the offensive line gave them a very clear runway before they had contact. I think you're going to see that 20th in the nation number go up now that you have running backs like Damian Martinez and others that can get more with that runway. And we talked about that with the running back group. But I think overall, very good run blocking year last year. Pass blocking, it's amazing that TVD was so interception prone. You're talking about 15th in the nation in quarterback sack percentage. That means basically the percent of dropbacks that resulted in sacks. Miami was 15th, so that's very, very good in terms of protecting the passer. What do you lose? Matt Lee, one of the best centers in the country, goes gets drafted by the Cincinnati Bengals late on day three. That doesn't really reflect the type of player he is, P. We talked about he had some back stuff, some, some chronic injury concerns that led him to dropping as a player. He's really more uh, – of a maybe yeah, he was a top five. I mean, based on the people I talked to last year, the NFL scouts thought he was a top five to seven center in the country, just based off the film and, and the football player. But that's not how the draft process works. So replacing Lee will be, uh, you know, obviously you have Zach Carpenter coming in, and we all think he could be, you know, really solid there. But replacing Lee is no easy task. Yeah, JV on Cohen, the guard from Alabama, tr- big time transfer coming in. Had a lot of hype, went to the Senior Bowl. Had a great season, I thought. Ended up going undrafted. We've talked about that. There was probably some you know, kind of off-the-field concerns that teams had. Didn't it was not a reflection of what he did on the field. On the field, he was a draftable player all day, in my opinion. And I think that's the, per- the perception from scouts. It's more off-the-field stuff that dropped him. He'll probably make that Cleveland Browns roster. So you lose two NFL players who were very good in college last year. That's the bottom line, center and guard. That's what you got to replace. What do you bring back? We'll go through position by position or player by player, but certainly to me, Jalen Rivers, Ines Cooper, Francis Malanoa, I would put those guys in the really in the elite category in the country. I think those guys are your premium guys that would be great players at Georgia, would be great players at Ohio State, Alabama, name the team, Michigan. I think those guys, not only can they play anywhere, I think they're going to be really good players anywhere they go. This is high-end talent with those three. Yeah, and with Jalen Rivers, you're talking about a guy who's played a ton of football, has played all over that offensive line, obviously is the left tackle. Maybe at the next level is is probably more of an interior lineman, a, a guard. But you talk about a guy who's been super solid and steady throughout his career. What a big time, you know, that was a big recruiting win because he could have left, he graduated, right? So I think that one, as we play some of his – uh his stuff here from last season, uh, you know, that was a, a huge, huge win in the off season for the staff. Yeah. I'm a huge Jalen Rivers fan. To me, he is underrated. He'll be on preseason, all ACC teams and all that. But to me, I don't think people appreciate how good he is. Yeah. He's not that top 10 pick left tackle in terms of athleticism, but he does a very, very nice job as a college left tackle. Talk about pro guard, maybe pro right tackle. I think he can do all of that stuff. He's big. He's explosive power. He was one of the top throwers in the state. He's when, smart. If he's beyond smart, he's top of the food chain in terms of intelligence. He works hard. He's not fat. Anybody ever seen it? Seen him? He doesn't. You know, he is a a, a lean machine at three hundred twenty plus pounds. He's flexible, not super twitchy, but he's twitchy enough. To me, he's a guy that plays 10 plus years in the pros. He is your anchor on the offensive line. He's a steadying force. He got a ton of experience. He's from the class of 2020. So he's basically played, you know, 20, 21, 22, 23, four years of experience. He's had some injuries, but he, he's stayed healthy the last couple of years, entering his fifth year of playing football. So the experience, the size, the power, the technique, the IQ, the production. He brings it to you. He's even played some center in practice. So the guy's played every spot on the offensive line. I heard that from what he did last year to the spring, he made another huge jump, particularly at left tackle and learning that position and just mastering that. So a lot of people try to move him to guard. Mirabal's push back on that. I'd push back on that too. I think this guy's going to be one of the best left tackles in the country and one of the best offensive linemen overall in the nation. My yeah, and, and listen, you mentioned it. It's like if you want to really nitpick – does he have the top tier athleticism that you look for at that position at the next level? Probably not. But every, I mean, it seems like he doesn't really have issues with guys who are, you know, speed rushers, guys who could, who would otherwise you would think beat him, you know, just, just off of their, their quickness off the edge there. So he, he takes that away. I don't, I don't really see how this isn't, you know, one of the top five, tackles left tackles in in college football 
no, I think it's a great year for Jalen Rivers. He's exactly what you want, kind of leading the charge with his IQ. Shifting gears to another player at right guard. So we're kind of moving from left tackle to right guard. I want to start with the real stars of this line. Another guy who, big, in shape, extremely smart academically and on the field. Experience and can do a lot for you. And that is Inez Cooper. Out of Alabama, he was a three-star player. He was a 400-pounder in high school, really slimmed down in high school just to get to that 350 range. Mario Mirabal identified him when they came over from Oregon. So he was a quick recruitment, a great, great evaluation by Mario Cristobal and Alex Mirabal. Comes in, I saw him in camp when he first got here. He was playing right tackle, doing a really nice job, holding up without a problem at right tackle. There's Anita guard. He shifts inside to guard midseason, does a great job, really moves people, continues to slim down, continues to learn the offense, has stayed in that guard position, and he's really one of the better guards in the country. Uh, someone that Cam Ward, P, when we interviewed him, was adamant that Inez Cooper is an impact guy on this offensive line. Uh, Starting to be more of a leader. He was very shy and kind of in a shell when he first got here, has become more vocal. And again, it's the same thing with Rivers. Smart, big, in shape, tough, can run block, can pass block. I mean, everything you want. Yeah, and I'm showing some clips here from his freshman year, which, remember, he wasn't expected to be he wasn't expected to play as much as he as he did freshman year. And you see even in these clips that he's way heavier uh, than than he is now. Obviously lost a lot of weight between that first year and year two. And then, you know, I've seen him recently and really, you know, looking like an, an NFL type lineman. And look, if he continues to take that step, he's definitely going to be in line to be you know, a top flight, top 100 type pick, I believe, um, at the next level, whether it's this year or next. Yeah, look, I got to be honest. I went back and watched all the games last year to kind of really focus on these three offensive linemen because they're the ones that were coming back. And I thought the most dominant of the three was Cooper, really. When you watch him, I mean, games like Clemson, I mean, he's just burying guys. Um, he was just a force, man, and very consistent. You saw flashes with Mao and just with his pure talent and, and – power and, and explosive this ability to run river steady Eddie at a more difficult position. But in terms of dominating college football games and, and moving guys out of gaps and just being, being a force that an S Cooper of the three guys we're going through is probably the best guy that I saw going back and watching last year. And he was very good in the spring as well. Again, exactly what you want that position and shout out to Mario Cristobal and, and Mirabal, not only for identifying this player who is not a highly rated recruit, but doing it on short notice. I mean, those, those, uh, transition classes you can get a lot of bad recruits because you're on the fly you're just trying to fill up spots you're losing guys you're adding guys it's just it's a compressed compressed process so to get a guy like this who's an nfl player and potentially a high round nfl player in that short time span from across the country from alabama somebody the sec missed on just an awesome job it shows you the evaluation ability not just the coaching and recruiting ability of cristobal and mirabal and the development right because he 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 comes in year 1 and plays out of necessity obviously the, listen losing the weight that's on him that that's on the player a lot of times i think that does get overblown by you know strength and conditioning staffs although they do a great job here at miami but that's on the player but he, he's obviously gotten better he he took that step last year in terms of consistency we expect him to do the same now um, but that's that's what it's all about is developing the talent that you do get to campus. No question about it. And it helps when the guy's smart. You know, that's, that's why it's good to recruit smart players. They they tend to develop more um, in terms of they take the coaching in a different way. They understand and they apply. Um, it's not you know, there's not an academic competition. There's a lot of guys with that didn't love school that happen to be great Hall of Fame all time football players. But. When you have guys with talent that have high academic and both Jalen Rivers and S. Cooper are all academic guys in the ACC, that just shows the discipline. So it's not a prerequisite, but when you have it and then you have the physical gifts, to me, the floor is raised. And those are the guys you want to bet on because you know if they're working hard in the classroom, they're going to be working hard on the football field and getting the most out of their talent. So love both those guys. Switching gears now to who I would say of those three probably has the most physical ability, just the most natural, the most talented, the highest rated, the highest paid, <laughs> you know, the guy that the, the big ticket item is Francis Mauanoa from American Samoa, 
Uh, ended up going to California, play some football, played defensive tackle as well, then goes to IMG, really hones in on offensive tackle. Top 10 player in the nation, comes to Miami on everybody's freshman All-America list, put on some major highlights. You've seen him pulling and just knocking guys on their butts. You saw him against Clemson, put, uh, putting Barrett Cooper, top uh, top, rec- uh, top player at linebacker, knocking him uh, to Sunday. Just a great space player, very fast. He's the fastest of all these guys just in terms of running around, and he's probably, to me, the most powerful as far as you're talking about just knocking guys back with power. That is what Francis Malanoa does, the explosiveness. He tests out of this world. Had some ups and downs at right tackle. Was not the most polished pass blocker. We saw run blocking. He was outstanding. Pass blocking, you saw flashes, but you also saw some, some big plays given up. North Carolina, Texas A&M, he, he, he was beat on, on occasion. Um, so the question with him is, is his ultimate position you know, all pro right guard or left guard? Is that where his ultimate home is? Is he an all pro? You know, some people think he's an all pro at those positions. Do you do you try to move him there earlier? Do you keep him at right tackle? Of course, true freshman, he really overperformed for his age. So it's not like he can't hang out there and survive. He did so, and he's going to get even better. But to me, it's going to be very interesting to see where does he wind up? Guard, where his pulling, his power, his ability to beat you up in a phone booth really plays up. Or tackle where he's athletic enough to do it, he's big enough to do it, but I'm not sure is his most natural spot. Well, and look, we'll get into the discussion more as we get into some of these other guys here, but it's all about getting the best five on the field, right? D so you're looking for that left guard who's gonna who's gonna end up winning the starting spot there. And there's some guys that we'll talk about that are probably more tackles than than guards, but they can play that guard spot is Francis is sliding him there and then using one of these other guys a tackle does that give you the best five so I, that's the that's the question that is going to need to be answered here during during camp in terms of the offensive line yeah by the way Barrett Carter not Barrett Cooper was the linebacker for Clemson that the Mountain Noah smashed like a bug second level he's just very very special uh moving on to the fourth guy who I think is a sure thing to start I kept him separate from the other three because the other three I feel are just like all America top, you know, three rounds of the draft type players. With Zach Carpenter, I wouldn't put him in that category. He wasn't honorable mention all Big Ten player at Indiana, big recruit when he went to Michigan out of Cincinnati Moeller. So I wouldn't put him in the category of those other three, but he is a solid starter. He is going to be the center. And I think he's going to do a very solid job. Seeing him in person, comparing it to Matt Lee, he's got size. He's six five, he's listed at six five, three hundred. Matt Lee's measurements are not that much different on the public stuff. By the way, keep in mind with offense alignment, these publicly reported sizes are usually way off. Um, I don't know why, but uh, it's hard to get updated size numbers that are accurate on these offense alignment. Just eye test wise, apples to apples, seeing them both on the same field. I think Carpenter is wider than Lee, Matt Lee, just overall bigger from what I could see. Um, Lee, way more athletic. Lee was one of the most athletic centers in the country. I think he was the most athletic center in the combine period. Really put on a show with his combine drills. I think he was a tight end in high school. Carpenter is a, is a true lineman from a from a factory in Cincinnati Moeller. Uh, actually, Alex Gall, a former Miami center from the same high school. Carpenter, a uh, more talented player in the center of your offensive line. I think that the athleticism is definitely a downgrade, but he's not unathletic, and I think his strength and, 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 and toughness – is there you watch against Ohio State last year? He held up very well for Indiana, and there were some knocks on him early on in spring. I heard just some buzz from some people that watch practice, uh, you know, saying they were concerned. I saw him progress throughout the spring when I watched practice and talking to people. I think the way he he finished the second half, there's not much concern about Zach Carpenter. And a guy that we've had on the show, obviously, did our interview with with him uh, through Kane's connection and. One of these transfers, do we talk about it with with a lot of these guys who are here for it's a business, it's a year of business for them, right? This is obviously transferring to Miami is is a, a glamorous thing from the outside looking in, or or can be uh, you know viewed that that way. But all he cares about is ball and and getting his his work done. So to me, another one who comes down here with with the right mentality and. As an offensive lineman, that's that's what you love, and that's why I like working with those guys. No, no doubt about it. You know, Cincinnati is a football hotbed. This guy's played top competition since he was a kid. Talk about what he did at Indiana: twenty-five starts in the Big Ten. So, 
you saw those defensive tackles for Michigan in the national championship game. There's some bad boys up there in the Big Ten in the trenches. So he's he's seen it all. I don't think he's going to be afraid of competition. I don't think the Gators are going to show him anything that he hasn't seen or, or, or performed well against. So very confident in Zach Carpenter in the middle. I would say he he could be a downgrade for Matt Lee, just again on the athleticism point. But I think overall he should be fine. It might be better in certain respects as far as just being a gritty run to, run blocker. We're about to move on to some of the unknowns, right? The positions that are up for grabs, some of the battles that are going on. But first, I want to talk about Canes wear. If you want to get your Canes gear for the season, summer gear, your coolers, your koozies, your tank tops, your towels, they got all that. Plus, they got the jerseys. I mean, we're almost in August, so just get your game-ready stuff. Your anti-gator shirts, they got those going back. Some great designs there. Get ready for the season. It's time. Load up. Start spending on your Canes gear. It is Canes season. Caneswear.com if you're not local. Caneswear in Davie if you want. You just drive there. Great great environment. Great vibes. Everything you need. Plus, they got Heat, Marlins, Panthers, uh, uh, the Stanley Cup champion Panthers, whatever you need. Caneswear.com or Caneswear. Okay. Left guard. I mentioned four guys that are set starters. This is the battle. Of course, there's going to be injuries. So, you know, there's going to be movement. But I think the four guys I mentioned – will be the starters barring injury. Now, who's the fifth guy? Who's the best? It's the fifth in the best five, P. You mentioned that that was a thing to watch. I think left guard and right tackle is where you saw these guys in spring. Francis Malino was out for spring. So the two guys I'm about to list, some played some right tackle with the first team, played some left guard with the first team, and um, you know really had the versatility to play both. But I will start with, to me, the favorite at left guard. Again, it's tricky because someone might be look better at right tackle. Someone might, might look better at, at guard. Who's going to be the guy? It's hard to say because you don't know what spot's going to be open. There's going to be injuries, unfortunately, throughout the course of a season. But if you're asking me who looked best at left guard, I would say Samson Okalola, the five-star from Massachusetts. 6'6", 300, he's listed at. He looks very good physically, big. You can tell you, he's a hard worker, which I think is a big thing. We interviewed him, Pete. He was very, very smart, very focused. Had all the intangible qualities you want. I think the surprise is when you talk about a five-star who is – some people thought he was the best player in the country coming out as far as you know in our building – I don't think he had the the, the blockbuster athleticism of, of what you expect as that kind of number one overall offensive tackle. Good athleticism, very quick getting to the second level. You know, great size as far as he's he's a lean big guy, and of course the IQ and intelligence and, and work ethic and want to top of the shelf. I think with him, maybe not the explosive power of like a Francis Malanoa, for example, who can really knock you off the ball and has all those sort of twitch factors all those power metrics, all those testing numbers. With Okalola, I think when you watch him, that wrestling background, which you don't normally associate, you normally associate that with like, you know, the center from West Virginia who went to Pittsburgh, who was a wrestler, who worked his way up from being kind of not the most talked about guy to an All-American. You don't usually associate that kind of wrestling grit with the elite top-of-the-line athlete, five-star offensive lineman. I think Okalola, who wrestled and had success in Massachusetts, that's more of what he is than sort of that super athlete tackle. He'll torque you. He'll move you with leverage. He's not going to blow you off the ball. But I think in that phone booth at guard, uh, he can do some nice things for you. Well, and I think his body, I showed a video there that he posted a couple of days ago, you know, working out this off season. His body is starting to look like, again, he's long. He's very long, but he's, he's starting to put that, that weight on that you, that you might, uh, you know, associate with an interior lineman and look, he's probably taller than what you would expect a, he's not this stout, you know, ball of muscle, uh, the way he's built that most of your interior interior lineman would look like. And, and look, an S Cooper, six, five, six, six. So he's, he, I wouldn't exactly call him stout, uh, like short and stout, but I really think that the work ethic is going to go a long way with this one D and the fact that he wasn't, Obviously, he had the injury that he had to deal with, but um, his his mindset was was really really good when we talked to him. And I know we've both heard similar things coming from coming from you know people around that would would you know say the same thing. One hundred percent. And look, I, I downplay his athleticism a bit, but this guy can get to the second level in a hurry. He's very quick. I think that's actually where he you know put him on an island 
maybe he's not as twitchy as you want, but in terms of climbing to the second level and then getting guys, not just, you know, some guys can get to the second level fast, but they can't locate the guy. They can't hit that small target. He can do that. He's very, very good at that. In fact, I think his strengths are that climbing to the second level and getting the off uh, and getting the linebackers. And also just, again, just torquing guys using that wrestling leverage, those hips to move guys out of the way and create holes that way. So excited to see what he could do. He also played right tackle in spring, but I thought guard was more where he was comfortable. Now, the, I'm going to talk about somebody who, to me, is the reverse. And that's the guy he's competing with, Matthew McCoy, also battling for that left guard spot, also had time at right tackle, played a lot last year as sort of that unbalanced tight end. He would put on the tight end uniform. You probably didn't even notice him, but he got a ton of snaps last year coming in as that extra tight end and bullying guys. So with McCoy, he was a high school tight end, which explains why he played so much tight end as a blocker last year, despite being 300 plus pounds. Great evaluation from Manny Staff. So this was a guy that Manny Diaz was on in his final days as coach. Identified him as a rising player, as a tight end up in St. Augustine. Had just switched positions and the body was clear it was going to be a tackle. So Manny caught him, identified him. Florida was in there as well. When when Maribel and Cristobal came in and looked at the board, they said, hey, this, this is a good evaluation. We should be recruiting this guy. They continued to recruit him, brought him in. He played, had a very good freshman year. He's been generating buzz for a while. That's why he played so much last year. Every time I talk to the staff about McCoy and people around the program, they say, look, this guy's an NFL talent. This guy's one of the twitchiest guys we have, one of the most athletic guys we have. He's got the tools. FCP, you saw him the other day. I mean, he's, yeah. he's got size, right? He's got he's got serious size. I think, again, offensive line, We and that's they want these body types, but – a lot of these, it's going to come down to the little things with him, I believe, D. Um, but the size and athleticism are, are there for him. How much has he cleaned up, though, you know, in this in these last, you know, year plus? I think that's the question. Yep, and I think it's the opposite of Samson. So with Samson, it's when you put him a tackle, is he going to be twitchy enough? Is he going to be able to handle some of the speed, right? Is he going to be consistent in the pass blocking realm? With McCoy, no worries about athleticism, no worries about Twitch. You're more worried about the, the physicality and the phone booth, right? Is he going to be that, that tough guy that you need at that interior spot if that's where he is? Even at right tackle, is he going to bring that, that energy and that, that, that aggressiveness that will allow him to turn that NFL athleticism into an NFL player? So I think that's what you see with that battle. That battle's ongoing. Again, both of them played a ton in spring. It was almost fortunate. I don't say anything's fortunate when you lose a guy like Francis Malanoa for spring. But – the fact that it was a cleanup procedure, nothing to be worried about. And now you saw both of those guys with the starting lineup all spring, either at left guard or, or right tackle. That, to me, gave them very, very valuable reps. See how the summer go, you know, has gone when you see him here in practice and see what the progression they've made. But those are the two names to watch as that fifth guy. And if there's an injury, you'll see both of them like you saw in spring. And again, this is, this is under the expectation that you know, everything stays, those four guys stay in those four positions that we expect. I don't, obviously Carpenter at center and, and Cooper are pretty much completely locked in, I believe. And listen, Jalen Rivers probably is as well as that left tackle, but you never know what could happen here in, in fall camp. Yeah, look, Rivers can play guard. I have even seen Rivers play center. Cooper never gets talked about as tackle, but I really do think that if you need him to play tackle, he could do it. You have a lot of guys that can play tackle here, which is what you want. You want guys that can play tackle playing inside as opposed to really forcing, you know, guys that shouldn't be playing anywhere outside the interior to those tackle positions on the Island. This staff has recruited guys with tackle bodies, with tackle ability, with tackle athleticism, and that's what you want. And then you'll find your interior alignment off of that group. We, listen, <laughs> we're talking about offensive tackle bodies, Pete. I mean, who, who, who is the number one imposing offensive tackle body? in the program right now. Markel Bells. You guys see this picture uh, from the other day. Uh, you see Markel Bell here. You see Samson. You see Francis. You see Torian Wilson, really good offensive line coach down here in South Florida. And listen, I've I've used I've gone back to this one thing regarding Markel Bell. I almost every time we talk about him, D, but I, I just I remember the comments made by Coach Cristobal the day that Bell signed with Miami and, and, he, and Coach Chris Wall could officially comment on him publicly. And he was gushing about him, right? And, and he basically said he's a guy who can be an immediate impact player for us. He's someone that Coach Mirabal 
mentioned during spring was consistently getting better. I know we're starting to get some reps, you know, with, with the ones at a certain point there during spring as well. And when I saw him in person at practice, the thing that I came away intrigued by is, and I'll, you know, the zoom in on this picture a little bit here, but when you have a six, eight, six, nine offensive tackle, a lot of times the proportions aren't where they need to be. The legs you know, are, are a little skinnier than, than you'd like them to be. You know, the, the flexibility isn't there. Very well proportioned uh, in terms of his body composition here. And you see him. He's obviously a huge guy, but he, he holds the weight well, moves well with that weight. And coming in from the JUCO ranks, obviously has a couple years on these guys in terms of the – maturity level but I, I think he's going to be in the mix here I think he'll be starting multiple games for one reason or another this season for Miami yeah I agree with you Pete 6'9 340 he was further along than I expected when I saw him in spring both in terms of the body he's 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 big but he's not fat at all and he's not too skinny so you know good summer which hopefully he's been having in the weight room I think he'll be fine physically IQ and just coachability and you know, he's raw, but he earned trust faster than I expected. Um, and I've heard great things about him off the field, talking to people. At one point, uh, at one point, I saw him at left tackle, Jalen Rivers at left guard, Zach Carpenter at center, Ines Cooper at right guard, and then Matt McCoy at right tackle. Of course, Francis Malano was, was injured in, in, in spring. But that line was the most physically impressive line I've seen in Miami in some time, just looking at it. Again, it was just a couple couple drills, you know, or a couple of uh, sessions where you saw that unit, but it shows you that they're fast-tracking Markel Bell. In a perfect world, yeah, he might redshirt, but this is 2024. Guys like this don't redshirt, uh, unfortunately, but it is what it is. I think he's – I agree with you, I think he'll start some games this year. We'll see how it all shakes out. Hopefully the injuries aren't too bad, but – he really held up well. Holds up better against the weaker rushers. I mean, a Ruben Bain gave him a lot of trouble. It gives everybody trouble. But against guys that aren't Ruben Bain, just the length alone is so hard to overcome, even if the technique and the footwork is not perfect. I saw one point where he was uh, in space, and he had to target a defensive back at the second level. I think it was Matt Michael Spencer. I don't recall exactly, but it was a fast, quick defensive back. He was able to get low enough, ident- you know, accurately target this defensive back despite being six nine in, in space which is not as easy as it sounds and then really finish with physicality and knock him back Mirabal sprinted from the other side of the practice field to markel bell to start you know hitting his helmet getting him pumped up because it really was a show of physicality athleticism and just the ability to target a smaller guy at that size is not easy because six nine is great when you're going this way but in space breaking down it becomes more difficult and he showed the athleticism to do that he is somebody, again, I think he starts multiple games this year, and I think he could be a really, really special player on this offensive line. Agreed. And look, it brings up this, the possible scenario of is is he potentially a right tackle and you slide Francis to that left guard spot. So that's, that's I think, something that could be in play here. Yeah, if I'm just designing the – if I'm playing NCAA and I want it to look a certain way, Jalen Rivers left tackle – uh, hopefully these guys all stay healthy, of course. Jalen Rivers, left tackle. Francis Maunoa, left guard. Zach Carpenter, center. Ines Cooper, right guard. Markel Bell, right tackle. I mean, that's as big and as nasty and as good looking as it gets as an offensive line fan. So we'll see if we see that at any point. Again, hope everybody stays healthy there. Another guy who we talk about looks the part. This is somebody who when he, when he first got on campus, actually it was a visit, he was standing next to Samson Okolola and Francis Maunoa, two five-stars. And he was the best looking one of all of them in terms of size, not being fat, but being huge and just looking like if you just looked at the picture. You say, who's the five star in this picture? You'd say this guy. And it was Tommy Kinsler, 6'6", 340 out of Ocala, Florida. Huge recruiting win for Mario Cristobal in the class of 23 going into Ocala and getting a guy that the Gators desperately wanted, which is not easy for those of you who know Ocala. Bring him in. Um, just a, a super athlete. A lot of people thought he would be a guard because of his size and his girth, which he still may end up at guard, but he has been working pretty much exclusively at the tackle spot. And I think athletically, no problem for him at tackle. He is very much athletic enough to play tackle. 
my read on him is I love for him. He's one guy I'd love for next year. You know, so you don't force him into action too much this year. Give him some some blowout opportunities, some opportunities in some of the lesser games, and then get him ready for next year to play, meaning 2025. But, you know, he is on track to be a major player in this program. We interviewed him, Pete, great personality, just a very likable kid. The talent with him is really supreme. Yeah, here's a picture that uh, his his former high school coach posted a couple couple uh, days ago. Here, John Brantley Sr. Of course, uh, his his son played quarterback at at UF. So you see, you know, you mentioned how hard it is to go into, you know, Ocala area there and grab guys. But everything I've heard about the kid, another one who, from what I've heard, a very very good work ethic. You see him in some of the pictures from his you know, recruiting days to now. He's lost some of that baby fat and. Like you said, he another guy who carries the weight well. He's not a sloppy body and is, you know has the athletic ability to be a big time guy potentially at the next level. It's about putting it all together now for him. Yeah, we interviewed him, Pete. Who really fun interview. He said he was the point guard when they play basketball, yeah. and, and I know when he was a, a young player, there's clips of him as a youth running back. So super athlete, great size. Doesn't really need to lose weight. Has held up well at tackle. I think the the issue with him is just consistency, maturity, using getting all the power out of his body. You know, I think that's still something he's working with. I don't think this is someone that you want in the mix to play this year, unless he makes a huge leap, which is very possible with this kind of athlete. But from what I saw in spring, solid second teamer, but not one of the guys that's the next man up. I think he'll play with the second team all year, get snaps get adjusted to the speed of the game. And then he's one of your better players, hopefully in 2025 and 2026, and then off to the pros. I think that's ideal progression for Tommy Kinsler. Definitely. Now we have next guy up here, D Ryan Rodriguez, who I think that can be a, you know, obviously doesn't look like he's going to be the starting center as of now, but had to come in at a, I want to say definitely during the Temple game last year and a couple other instances last year when Matt Lee, uh, you know, was out of the game, was injured or whatever. And I think that they're, they're a pretty solid job in his time out there. It started the Rutgers game as well. Rutgers, yes. That was uh, the other he's somebody that I saw in uh, high school quite a bit. And I liked him a lot. You know, I saw my camp really having his way with Leonard Taylor. Leonard Taylor was killing everybody at the camp at that time, five-star player, and Rodrigo was able to stop him. This is someone who's been a very good player since youth football, was a very good player at Columbus, played some tackle. But at center, he, he's the right size there. And look, look at the Manny Diaz guys, right, which is what Rodriguez was. He was not recruited by Cristobal and Mirabal. How many of those guys are still around? It's a very, very small number. So the fact that Rodriguez is still here, tells you a lot i think what happened with him was manny's last year they were so focused on keeping their jobs that they really weren't developing guys i mean they were if you weren't if you were a developmental player you weren't getting a lot of attention because they were just coaching for their jobs very desperate cristobal's first year he gets hurt so injury really sets him back in a major way then then last year picks it up then in spring had a very, very good spring talking to multiple sources. I mean, they were looking at potentially bringing in a backup center, right, to to just fortify that spot. But they had a lot of confidence in what Rodriguez could do. Uh, so he's that's why he is still here. He is the backup center. And I think he could take a leap. You know, if you compare him to like a Lou Cristobal, I think he's more like the other Cristobals, Mario and his brother, the elder Lou Cristobal, in terms of guys that really worked their way into guys that could play at the high levels. I think Rodriguez, he's not going to come in and be amazing right away. He's progressively gotten better every year. Again, had a slow start because of the factors I just mentioned. But I think if you could keep him there until he's, you know, a sixth year player, he could be pretty good. You know, and it, that sounds like, yeah, six year. But that's some of these guys are like that in the modern era with the COVID and everything else and injuries. You know, age is important. And I think he's somebody who, now he is entering his fifth year. He's a class of 2020. Actually, sorry, he's, he's entering his fourth year as a class of 2021 yeah. kid. Fifth year, sixth year, I think you'll see the best Ryan Rodriguez and he'll have a chance to compete for a starting job. But he's really one snap away with the way the team is currently set up. And I'm excited to see what he does in spring. Well, I, I think you just said it right there. He's, he's a guy that I feel comfortable enough 
if if something happens in a pinch, you need him to play that center spot that he could that he could do the job without a doubt. Yeah, I said spring. I want precisely what he does in camp. Yeah. But a big center, he's not undersized at the position. And I think again, years of strength and conditioning is starting to catch up because he's a very hard worker and knows what he's doing. Very telling. There's a guy that was not recruited by Crystal Ball and Mirabal had injuries, had a lot of reasons to be forced out, and he's still here. That should tell you something because he is in a position to potentially play this year serious snaps due to injury. Another guy who played last year, Lou Cristobal, another Columbus guy, obviously the son of Lou Cristobal, Mario Cristobal's nephew, um, Georgia State transfer, drew a lot of ire last year uh, for some of the, you know, the fact that he was playing over guys that were more physically talented. I, I understand the criticism personally because I don't think Lou Cristobal played very well against Rutgers, and I think in spring he was placed at that starting left left guard spot until really being forced out by Okanlola and McCoy. I don't think he played very well in, in, in spring. And I say play very well. This, this is a tough guy. This guy's a, this guy's, you know, somebody who can play at the college level. You know, it's not like he has no talent. I mean, you're talking to two guys who, who didn't have talent for varsity. This is a guy who's playing college football. So I'm not trying to diminish his talent. But in terms of when you're going against the absolute high level guys, size, speed, I, I don't think he he was up to par. In those categories, he was tough. He was reliable, which is why I think he was sort of used to really push some of the more talented guys to displace him, which they ultimately did. By the end of spring, he was no longer playing with the first team at all. You had Okanola and McCoy kind of trading off there. So I think his role now is going to be maybe special teams, maybe breaking case of emergency at guard. But I do think that his time, at least as far as a contributor to the Hurricanes, on the field now he's contributing in practice he's contributing in the weight room he's contributing in a lot of ways but as far as like being a starter being a guy that's on the field i'm not sure that's in the cards for him but he does have experience if you need him definitely a few more guys here to talk about in terms of i would say the developmental side here d um and we'll start with uh derek plaz derek plaz we had him on the podcast probably the, i mean you talk about they call him the mayor of jacksonville some of the people that uh recruited him some of the coaches and i see why hearing him talk the guy is like he he is extremely sharp extremely bright extremely engaging um and that's important i've talked about that a lot i talk about that in all positions but of course offensive line that's a critical one you want guys that are on the high end of the intelligence and uh derek platz is definitely that um talented good body movements he, he he's kind of slinky uh, with his way, his ability to get out of bad spots. He's not like a freak athlete by any means, but he can adjust his body in a way that um, requires some athleticism. NC State and Penn State were on him, two very good offensive line developing schools. I think his size is probably on the lowest end of what you want at the tackle position at the Miami Hurricanes right now. He's like about that six, four, six, five, good shape, um, but not like a, a Tommy Kinsler that you see and say, wow. Could also play guard. Um, had a nice spring, mostly with the third team. He did have some second team reps. I think to me, he's he's going to be a solid guy that you can count on down the road. You you expect him to keep developing because of what he has between the ears and, and the talent is 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 not overwhelming, but it's it's above the line of, of of playable at Miami with the line you want. So I think you need guys like this, and I'm happy to have him in the program. Yeah, and and listen, hopefully he continues to put the good weight on, and maybe he could slide inside as well. Um, to to play guard eventually, and you know, again, these guys who have the tackle guard versatility put themselves in position to get on the field. And again, with his intelligence, a guy like that, you can use him in a pinch, right? And I'm not saying it's necessarily this year, but down the line, uh, I think he could be be a contributor. Yep. And so high floor guy with Derek Plaz, good guy to have in your program. I think you could see him starting games for the University of Miami based on what I saw in spring. Frankie Tinelau, kind of a wild card guy. You know well, Pete, from, from your days as an agent. Um, he is an interesting guy. Australian, moved to Miami, played at LaSalle. Dad is Samoan, mom is Spanish. Uh, really athletic guy. Uh, does not have a lot of w bad weight on him at all. Similar to, to, to Mau Noah in some ways. Not as explosive and talented, but kind of in the same mold as far as being a power guy. Had a really, really good senior year. Kind of put it together and, and, and took a major step in his understanding of the game. Came to Miami. Had some back issues that sort of delayed his debut. Put him on the sidelines. So now in spring, he did drills. He wasn't doing full contact until the very end. 
I saw him perform uh, in spring, but again, very limited reps. Interested to see what we get out of Frankie Tinelau in fall camp because he does have a lot of ability. Yeah, shout out to Coach Helder Valle over there at LaSalle who did a great job with him. And and again, that transition, D, you know, he was here. He had been in California a little bit, but like really getting immersed in South Florida football and, you know, the competition, the speed down here, that was a big, you know, I think, part of his growth. And then I, I know that he's itching because he's been, he's been hurt. He's itching to show what he's got because he was part of a, such a talented group of offensive linemen coming in, in terms of his freshman class. Um, and he, he wants to remind people that he's, uh you know, he's part of that group. And I think, you know, based on what I know, again, had some, had some baby weight that he, that he dropped has, leaned out in a good way and already didn't have he didn't have you know a ton of bad weight on him if any at all but i think that he's a guy again that you look at you look at the second third team offensive lineman right now and it's a bunch of guys in there who have the ability to be big time starters at miami one day so that's that's the depth you're continuing to look to build no question about it um Another guy in the mix, Antonio Tripp, IMG lineman, class of 2023. Stop me if you've heard this before. Great kid. We interviewed him. Just super engaging and had, had the right type of personality. He's been – people pencil him as a guard, as a center coming out. This is a guy from Baltimore. He's on the shorter side. Um, but really he's been mostly playing guard and tackle with the third team. And I think he's a guy that's still finding his way. Maybe he ends up at that center position, but he's someone who's still kind of working his way in. He's going to need to be that versatile piece because he doesn't have the physical traits of some of these guys, you know, like Markel Bell or or, or Malanoa, guys like that. So a guy like him who's on the shorter side is going to need to have that versatility, the command of the offense, and is just going to con- continue to keep on working. But he's he got a lot of reps because he's so versatile and, and really played pretty much every spot on the third team except center but he could have that in the future so you know excited to see what he does from a versatility standpoint w- one guy i want to highlight here pete the last one nino francavia interesting path for this guy he's from canada was committed to harvard came down to camp in miami miami ended up offering him he ended up being the center in this class i saw him in spring quite a bit and he's he big. most he mostly played with yeah mostly played with the third team but physical trait wise, man, if you told me this guy was a four star, not some guy that we got from Harvard, I would have believed you. No problem. He's a four eight shuttle guy in our camp. So he has that. But just the physical look of him. He's a big center, man. He, he's he's as big as any center we've had and, and athletic and twitchy as any center we've had um, out of the high school ranks recently. So I was impressed, man, with the physical part, the football way too early to tell, at least for me. Um I asked around. They said, you know, so far so good. He's got a lot of, of football to play. But you want to see physical tools with a guy that you get with this kind of background. And I think with him, you saw that. And now it's we'll see where he ends up. I mean, you know, we love this stuff here. But and we mentioned it before. He said it in his interview with us. But his dad played goalkeeper at the highest levels in Italy, you know, for for a club body, which it's, I mean, it's a big club. So the the bloodlines there, obviously. So I – and and I've seen him myself, uh, you know, in in street clothes. D the size is there. He looks. I mean, he looks like he could play guard if if need be down the line. But I I think center is probably where where he was recruited to play. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because I've asked. So when I asked about him, because you have Ryan Rodriguez coming back, who you expect him to continue to sort of get more solid on this lineup as as the years go. So next year, he comes back. You bring in CJ Alafatuli, number one center in the SJ, country. Sj. S.J. Alifatuli. Thank you, sir. That's why you're there. S.J. Alifatuli from Bishop Gorman, the best center prospect in the nation. We did an interview with him on, on, on canesinsight.com. You want to check out, again, all free. Max Buchanan, who we're recruiting as a guard from Sanford Seminole, he can also play center, and I heard he's going to get a crack at that job as well next year. Nino's in that mix, and again, talking to people about that, they said, yeah, he's in the mix at center next year, and also, if one of those guys jumps out at center, he can play guard as well, like you mentioned. So he's in the plans. He's showing some flashes. We'll see what progress he made over the summer. Very excited to see him in August. And he'll be battling both him, Tripp, Tinalau. These guys are gonna be battling the the, the five-star defensive tackles that we brought in, who are gonna start, you know, on the on the on the third team and potentially work their way up. So those are gonna be some really fun battles to see in August camp. 
Man, we went we went almost fifty minutes here, D. Uh, a couple of years ago, we I don't know if we could have gone fifteen minutes talking about the offensive line. So, or if we didn't, we were we were hyping up stuff that uh, shouldn't have been hyped up. But we've done that before, so it wouldn't be the first time. Yeah, a lot easier now when you're talking about the guys that are six nine, three forty, and can move. Uh, that makes the job a lot easier. But again, thank you everybody. Remember, like and subscribe to this podcast. Sign up to CanesInsight.com forums if you haven't already. It's all free. Six point nine million posts and counting. The most active Canes community on the planet. And especially now we get to August preseason, everybody's going nuts, posting their opinions, fighting, having fun, cracking jokes and getting juiced up for what could be the best cane season in a long, long time. Again, sign up for free. Appreciate everybody for listening. Go Canes. Go Canes. Yeah. This an insight to the Canes And you know we ain't playing no games Joaquin said dominate, so that's what we do Home of the legends and 7th floor crew Down in Miami where hurricanes brew You here for the rumors, we bring you the news Cause it's all about the you And nobody do it like Canes in sight 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 it's Kane's insight.